Good morning. It is the middle of May. It's gorgeous. I hope you can see the sun shining in here through the woods. One of those mornings where the light is just coming in perfectly and you just want to stop and take it in, which is what I'm doing. Plan for today is to go to that spot that I've been going to a lot lately and have a lakeside lunch. Um, I've tried to do this a couple times in the last week or so, and the wind has just been over the top. The hike has been good, but the weather just wasn't working as far as recording a video goes. So hopefully today, it's still a bit windy, but hopefully today it won't be so windy that I can't record a video and share my lunch with you. Well, I hope you're all doing well. I hope that you're weathering this storm as best you can. I hope that you're finding an opportunity in some way to get out of your house and if you can get into the woods. I'll tell you it has been good for my physical as well as my mental health to be able to do this. The weather here has been, well let's put it, it's not the best spring, let's put it that way. It's been a rainy spring quite a bit and when it wasn't rainy uh, the winds were so high and we'd have, we had some near, near hurricane storms in the last two weeks dumping not only rain but snow as well. But that's not today. Today it's much nicer, it's warmer already, and uh, I think it's going to be a great day. I hope you follow along. I'm not sure that there's any spring edibles because of the delayed season, but I'm looking, and if I find anything, I'll share it with you. So I walk past this point on the trail, well, just about every time I come into the woods, I guess, and this old pine tree, it is a white pine, eastern white. Uh, you know, I looked at that today and I thought, what do you think? Is there fat wood down in that knob? Well, I'll uh, set up the tripod and see if I can't capture taking the, that off right at the base and see if there's any fat wood in there. If there is, I'll have to save it because, of course, I still can't have an open fire. All right, let me set the tripod up and I'll see what I can find in there. Promising. Solid. Take this one off first. There's fat wood, not a lot, but well, that's all fat wood, it's just not the best quality, but worth keeping. Ah. Oh, it smokes. I don't know. May have been better off with a an axe. Oh, start and see what happens. Small axe I've been working with, testing out, very inexpensive, but seems to be high quality. 
a little short for doing this type of work, especially at the angles I'm working at. But it's getting that stuck feeling that often comes with fat wood, like you're going through something gooey. It's in there. I'll have to work to get it out, but there is fat wood in there. All right, lunchtime. So what I'm going to do is set my stove up in the fire pit that I have here because, of course, it's there's still a fire ban. Uh, actually, I can understand it. We did have some big rains lately, but uh, the temperatures, uh, well, the temperatures have been low, but the humidity has been very low and the winds have been high. So it has dried the forest so tremendously. Uh, and, but that's not the reason for the fire ban. The reason for the fire ban is the state of emergency. We've talked about that before. But as we have talked about that before, there are a couple of things that I can do during the state of emergency which still allow me to cook a lunch out here. So I can use alcohol or gas and I can use charcoal. And again, that's what I'm going to use today is charcoal. But I'm going to do it a little differently. Something I haven't tried before. I've been looking forward to trying and that's my Brennoli the hobo stove, the one I reviewed some time ago, and of course I'll put a link to that video if you're interested. I'll put it at the end. And I've looked at it and it's, you know, it's super flat, super light, well designed for wood, well designed for gas and alcohol. Nothing in the literature says anything about using it with charcoal or wood pellets, and I'll show you why I think it'll work well with the charcoal. I don't think, at least unmodified, it's not going to work well with pellets. I may try that later with some modification, but let me just assemble this. That's basically all there is to it. Just flatten that last little pan down. There, okay. So if you look inside, 
you should be able to see that there is a fire grate to hold the wood or in this case charcoal off the bottom there is an ash pan on the bottom to catch any coals from falling through with a bit of a gap in between the tall narrow nature relatively tall and narrow nature of this should lend it well for use with charcoal so that's what I'm going to do another fire starter that commercial one I'm going to light this a little different today I'm going to try to put this in first and light it from underneath with the tinder wick so I'll put those in and put some charcoal inside Let me, I'm not sure if you can see this so here's where that's going to sit that looks fairly stable I still have some work to do in this fireplace to get a good stable use is that going to work yeah that'll work there and I have declared in the past that I like the natural chunk charcoal the best but I have a nice big bag of briquettes might as well bring them out and try them I'll put in about a dozen maybe to start takes a while I'm doing this first of course before starting my my lunch because it takes a while for the charcoal to establish itself and I want to be able to clean my hands off before I start working with the banners especially uh, that should be enough to get it going maybe one more it's not going to go to waste because it take a while to cook everything I'm cooking And of course then I have to have coffee. So I'm going to use the tinder wick. And I'm going to go in underneath the fire grate. So between the ash pan and the fire grate, I'm going to slide this once it's lit underneath and catch that uh, fire starter on from underneath it there. So again, the trick with these is to get them all fluffed up very, very fine. The way I like to use it is on, lay it on top of whatever striker I have. And then just strike downwards with the fire steel. Like that. Slide it in. And I'll leave it there for a minute until I'm fairly sure that it's caught the fire starter should be able to see in a second already see smoke rising good so I'm going to let that get established I'll reestab reposition the camera and show you how I make my lunch all right well it will take a little while for that charcoal to really get established and uh, I had to quickly fashion myself a pair of tongs I mean not very effective or not very good I should say but effective they do the job probably used a thicker branch than I probably should have and I need this for reaching into the hobo stove to pull out a few of the charcoal pieces for the baking that I'm going to be doing I'll, I'll explain that in a few minutes so the first thing to get started with is going to be the bannock and I just want to talk for a few minutes about bannocks and breads in general that you can make in the woods so uh, a lot of this is just going to be review most of you would know this already but it just helps to clarify just how easy it can be to make bread when you're out in the woods it doesn't have to be anything special no real special effort this is going very old school very simple so basically there are two types of breads in the world and those that are leavened and those who are unleavened leavened breads are the ones that rise and give you that nice airy texture they're usually leavened with yeast or some other agent like baking soda or baking powder um, but long before those were started to be used in breads the just about every culture in the world has some type of flatbread and a flatbread is simply exactly that a flat unleavened bread and it can be that simple when you're making bannock and all the ingredients really are is flour and water whatever type of flour whether it's wheat flour barley flour rye flour oat flour whatever you want then you can mix that with a little bit of water and you can make yourself a bread it's just that simple cooking is another thing we can talk about but uh, for the short term let's just talk about the breads so if you've got flour and you've got water you've got your basic ingredients if you want to add to that the first thing you add is salt so you, a little bit of salt will go a long way and help it don't ask me what it does I'm not the baker but I know that a little bit of salt goes a long way in making it work a lot better after that if you want to give it some uh, leavening some rising some baking powder will go a long way 
Yeast is fine, it just takes time for the yeast to proof and actually start to grow and make the bread full of air. So uh, I'm, what I'm going to be using today, I'll explain in a second. After you have water or flour, water, salt and some ra raisin agent, you can add other things. A lot of people will start to add fats, either butter, shortening, lard or oil and mix them into the, uh, the flour and that makes it of course moister and a nicer bannock overall. But to be honest, you don't need that. You can just go very, very basic. And that's what I'm going to do today. So what I have, and I carry with me quite often, is a flour mixture. And uh, you don't have to have this. It can be as simple as white flour that you have already at home if, you're, if you haven't run out of it at the stores like they have around here. But this is something I bought at one of our, our stores here locally some time ago, Bulk Baron. And I bought a mixture of things that I put together in here. So I have, there's a uh, multi-grain flour, there is a little bit of white flour, there's whole wheat flour, but then I added things like corn flour, rye flour, barley flour, oat flour, can't think if I added anything else. So a little bit of just about all the flours I could find there at the bulk burn, and I keep it in a bag. I don't pre-mix anything. All that's in here is those flours, salt, and some baking powder. And I can't even tell you the proportions. I just put some in. It's not all that important, really. Uh, the more you put in, the lighter and fluffier it gets, but then there's a point at which the flavor isn't all that good in my mind. So, uh, yeah, pretty basic. So I do things a little differently when I'm trying to make my bread. It's not going to be a consistent size every time. I actually start with my bowl. And yes, you could do this right in your fry pan. You could do it right in the bag. Pour literally, pour water, make a little well inside of the flour, pour a little water in, stir it until all the water is consumed, take the clump out, and you've got a bread. What I do is I put in, I'm going to say, actually it looks like a fair amount, but I'm going to say about four or five tablespoons of water probably won't be able to see that yet and I'm just going to start adding flour until I'm ha and mixing it until I'm happy with the consistency so what have I got there a couple of tablespoons first little mixture is going to just be a sloppy runny mess of course and a little water goes a long way when you're doing this Uh, still quite sloppy. You know, I could make a pancake out of this and just put it into a hot fry pan as it is with a nice loose batter and make a pancake. That'll work. But I'm going to make a bread. I, you know, it's not truly a bannock. It's just a bread, a flatbread or fry bread. All right, now we're getting closer. What I'm looking to ha see happen is, is as I stir and all the flowers incorporate it with the moisture eventually it'll start pulling away from the sides and stop sticking which is starting to happen now all right that's looking pretty good don't let that fool you that's not quite ready because as the more i mix it through the more it starts to stick again but it's close a little bit more And I think we're there. And this is the reason I wanted to wash my hands after the putting the charcoal in the stove, because now I'm just going to pick it up and finish working this with my hands. Do it too early, you get really sticky hands. If you wait until you get it just about right, you get a nice little patty did leave a little bit behind in the bowl, but that's okay. That I'm ready to cook. So, I'll get the fry pan on, I'll show you what I'm doing, and I'll put this in. This takes a, doesn't take too long, but uh, uh, it takes a few minutes to cook. That's why I wanted to do this before going on to the next part of my lunch. I'll just put this aside. By the way, if you leave it set for a few minutes, it even gets a little bit better before, uh, before cooking it. So I'll just put that aside. Get, go on to the next step. Okay, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to capture everything in the camera here. So what is the next step? So 
Some time ago I put together a set of fry pan and pie plate in a, a little kit that I can take out and I wanted to show you these for a second. This is very similar to what you'll see Steve selling at the firebox stove and uh, you know, I was looking at what he had for sale and I said, man, I'd like to have that. Maybe I'll save up my, my money and see if I can't afford one. But when I was going through Value Village on different dates, I found pretty much exactly the same items. What I have is the GSI Outdoors fry pan. It is a non-stick fry pan of good quality and this was virtually brand new. I couldn't see any and that's usually what goes is the the interior usually gets all scratched up and people using knives and things inside. This was perfect. I didn't see anything wrong with it at all. And then on another day I found this pie plate and this is a heavy duty anodized aluminum ply plate. This one is made, in case you're able to find one, by Fat Daddios. And I looked them up. They do make the quality, mostly commercial type of uh, equipment. This one does have a few marks from when people use knives inside, but it's not going to hurt it. They're both 9 inch. And I'm going to be using them like an oven. But in order to do that, I need to take out a few of those hot coals, which is why I made the pincers. And it is hot in here too. I think I'll only need two of them. Oh yeah, it's hot. Very hot. I think I'm going to have to put my gloves on to do this. Oh, there we go. I got two out. At the same time, I'm going to replace it with a couple of unburnt ones. Now, I debate it. Do I put it on directly or do I put the cross stand on? I'm going to go directly on because the way the stove is designed, there are air holes all the way around. So I'm not in any way smothering the... Uh, the stove out, if, but I will have to keep an eye on the bannock as I cook it so that uh, it doesn't get too hot and I'll be flipping it quite often. So put the pan on, it does, and you'll notice I'm not putting any oil in. I could have put oil in this and done it like a fry bread, but uh, uh, I've done this dry like this and it works out just fine. So there's my bannock, put that in, put that on top. I am going to need gloves in a minute though. It works better with charcoal on top, but it works It works without putting the charcoal on top. If you're able to put charcoal on top, I've done this over an alcohol stove and it works out well. I can just get a little browner a little quicker by having a few pieces of charcoal on top. So I am going to have to check that quite often to make sure I don't burn it. And I have a little flipper. I haven't fashioned myself a wooden one yet. I might even do that today if I can find the right piece of wood. A little flipper just to flip it a few times to make sure it doesn't get burnt. Okay, I'm going to show you flipping it a few times at least and uh, when that's done we'll set it aside and we'll get ready to go on to the next step. All right, about seven or eight minutes. Leather gloves required for this. Let's see what we got so far. That's starting to brown. It's also starting to Rise a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. Put that on. It's going to take a little while more. I don't know, maybe maybe 15 minutes now total. I flipped it one more time. Uh, I'm thinking it's done. How do you know? Well, start with, let's expose it. So what do I look for? That hollow sound, to be quite honest. That and some browning on both sides. And I see browning and that hollow sound. And uh, I'm going to call that good. And what I need to do now is take it out. Where am I going to put it? Yeah, put it back in the bowl that I cleaned out. Because that's going to stand aside for a few minutes. It needs to cool off regardless. Clear the fry pan off for a second. Whoa, there's some heat coming out of there. Throw those two coals in. And now we have our fry pan ready to go. Do you know, you can use these to fry in if you want to. Certainly that's the way Steve designed them at the firebox stove. And I could, uh, but I don't feel the need to. So what's next? Next, a slice of Spam. 
And this is my last of the singles that my friend Wade at Woodwalker 1965 sent me some time ago. He had been in the States because, of course, we don't get these in Canada. And uh, he found these and he sent me a couple of them, a couple of three, I believe. And this is my last one. Spam. Yes, bacon would have been nicer, but this spam will work. So I think what I will do is I brought olive oil. I'm going to put a little bit in. And of course that lets you know that the pan is not level. So that I can put the spam in and brown it up a little bit. Yes, spam is full of fat. It did not need that oil. But why not? Instant sizzle. Gotta love it. So I'll be cooking that with the cover off, of course, for a few minutes. And then will come the last ingredient. Okay, I just put this back in the fry pan, or I have it in the fry pan just a couple seconds now, because it occurred to me I wanted to do something with it, and you may be interested. One of my spice kits. So what do you put on Spam? Well, you don't need salt, but if everything goes well with garlic. A little bit of garlic. At least I believe everything goes well with garlic. And Montreal Steak Spice, the spicy version. Yes, it does have some salt in it, but it also has some chili flakes and a number of other things. Let's see. Yep, browning up. Man, there's some heat coming out of there. I think I'll have to throw another uh, piece of charcoal in, though. So this Brennoli is working perfectly with charcoal. It, this is a good alternative. If you don't have wood, or you can't have an open fire, I guess, so you can always find wood. But if you can't have an open fire, and uh, you don't want to use your char or your alcohol, which is a good option, or a gas attachment, which is also a good option, you you can always use charcoal, and it seems to be working really well here. All right, I'll flip that one or two more times, and then we'll put the last ingredient to breakfast in. Or I guess it's lunch, isn't it? You know, yes, I know. You don't have to tell me. Anybody who's ready to hit the keyboard, this is not a healthy lunch. No, no, it's not. Spam is not your healthiest food in the world. I mean, it's not the worst, but it's not the healthiest food. But uh, sometimes a little bit of extra fat in your diet. I am going to be walking this off before the end of the day. So the extra calories that I'm putting on here, uh, they'll be walked off as well as the salt and everything else. I know it's not a healthy meal, but boy, it's going to taste good just the same. It's going to taste even better because I'm cooking it over a charcoal in the middle of a wilderness area on one of the most beautiful days that I've been out here. I think yet this year. Yeah, this is the nicest day yet this year. All right, I think that is now ready to call good. I may put it back in the pan to reheat it in a second. And of course, now the pie plate becomes my dinner plate. Last ingredient of lunch. Eggs. Two eggs. I sometimes have one egg, sometimes two eggs. Today it is going to be two eggs. I, if I need a little bit of oil. It doesn't No, I don't think so. It looks like it's pretty good there. Let's see if I can't get these in without breaking them. Because you know, of course, they taste better when the yolks aren't broken, right? When the stove is smaller than the uh, diameter of the fry pan, you're going to get hot spot in the center. So, well, and that's true of cooking any way you cook on the fire, on a fire. It's always going to be a little bit of a guessing game moving things around to get the right temperature and right heat. I think what I'll do is just turn that a little sideways for the second egg so one doesn't sit on top of the other. All right, good so far. And they need a little bit of spice. Where's my spice cat? Oh yes, garlic, yeah, absolutely. My wife would say, stop. She's not here. 
Whoa! Yeah, that's plenty. All right, that's not going to take too long to cook. I'll put the crossbars on, start heating my water for coffee. Now, I readily admit I am not a great cook. I don't cook a lot at home. My, my good wife is an excellent cook. She does most of the cooking. I'm usually the person that goes in, digs out the leftovers, makes something out of those. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun to cook in the woods. It doesn't matter how skilled you are. You can get out in the woods and do a little cooking. You'll enjoy it no matter what it looks like, no matter what it tastes like. Well, it's not ready to flip yet. Do you know I have cast iron fry pans? I have carbon steel fry pans. I even found one of those little Bromleys that my friend Wade carries. I found it at uh, Value Village, the thrift store. He'll, he won't want to hear this, but I pay, think I paid $2.99 for it. A little beat up, but that just adds character. But uh, there's nothing, to me, there's nothing wrong with this fry pan. It's working out well. All right, I'm going to flip those eggs in a minute, and I'm not going to let you see me do it because I'm going to be embarrassed when I break them. And then when the lunch is all ready, we'll sit down, enjoy lunch, and we'll have a little conversation. All right, let me, uh, let me show you. So right after I said that you weren't going to, I wasn't going to let you see me flip the eggs because I'd likely break them if you're watching, they didn't break. They came out perfectly. Just nice, nicely done. Over easy, a little bit solid, a little bit of liquid in it. There's my spam all cooked up and my quick bannock. Now, let's see if I can get focused on where I'm going to be sitting. Ugh. All right, that looks okay. All right, now, lunch. Wooden fork that I carved. You know, a fork is not a lot harder than a spoon. If you have any skill or you want to try doing a spoon, um, try a fork as well. Really, it's not a lot harder at all. You still start with the basic shape, that check mark type of a shape. I mean, look at a, kit, a fork you'd use at the table and you'll get the basic idea. The tines, straight, sawn in. I used a, uh, what did I use for this? Oh yeah, a, a, a Swiss Army knife, just to saw straight in and then very easily, very gently work on the tines. It's not as strong as a metal fork. No, it's not, but it still works. Let's see what we've got here. And I don't think I can do this well at home. <laughs> I always feel bad when I put a meal together in the woods that when I taste it, and it just strikes me as the perfect meal. I'm sharing it with you, but not really, am I? But were you here with me, I would love to share you a bite. Let's try a little bit of the Spam. Yes. Been a long time since I had that. Oh, the garlic and the Montreal steak spice. And having fried it, when you brown it a little bit, brings all the flavor out. <laughs> what about the bannock? All right, bannock is broken, not cut. It's just your tradition. What do you think? Did that work? That's pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. So in full honesty, it's not, I mean, it's great. It's airy, it's light, it's fully cooked. It's not as moist as if I had added oil or margarine or shortening or something to it. But I'm using it to dip up the egg. Mmm. Oh my. <laughs> I don't know what to say. This is like perfect. Okay. Totally unfair. Making you watch me. You could I guess you could have fast forwarded, 
but making you watch me eat this lunch. So I'm going to turn the camera off. I'm going to finish this lunch, clean up a little bit, and my water's on the charcoal stove. I don't know. I put the crossbars on. I'll show you when I go to make the coffee, but put the crossbars on. But with the charcoal, I'm not sure it's producing enough heat to bring the water to a boil, at least not very quickly. That's okay. I did bring an alcohol stove if I need to, but I'm in no rush. It'll, uh, it'll probably bring the water to a boil. And the reason why I want it boiling, of course, it's lake water, and I just want to be sure it's, that it's purified by the heat. But then it's coffee time in a few minutes, and that's when I bring her back. All right, I just wanted you to see this as I make the coffee. A couple of things. One, I refocused the camera on the Brindley Hobo stove, and I'm using my Camawil 1.2 liter pot. And I uh, just wanted you to see that it is, in fact, boiling hard. So I'll take that off, only for a second. You know, uh, there's enough heat. I probably put in 10, 12 coals, or briquettes. I think there's enough heat left in there I could start all over again. So I'm going to have to wait quite a while for that to burn out. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is, and this may be a little bit more ecologically sound for some of you, if, uh, if you're concerned about the paper filters that uh, a coffee maker uses, such as my AeroPress here. They, even though they're very small paper filters, you still have to do something with them when you're finished. And of course, if I have an open fire, no problem. And it goes to the open fire and it disappears within seconds. Uh, the, the coffee grounds, I don't mind distributing those or burying those. They're organic. They will compost. The paper does not. So I always take the paper home, if, unless I do have an open fire. But here's an alternative. You can buy little stainless steel screens, very, very finely perforated screens, to replace the filter. Uh, they are a little looser. In other words, the coffee will go through a little faster, and you have to make sure your coffee is ground a little coarser than you would with a paper filter. But uh, you wash that off, you use it again. All right, I believe that's cooled off just enough. I know you can't quite see the whole AeroPress as I pour here. Bubbling, big bloom on top, and that looks nice. I'll give that a little stir. This one's going to be rich. I put a little extra coffee in this time. Just upping my dose each a little bit, and I may have gone just a little over the top. We'll see, though. I could touch more water. I'll cap that without spilling any. Leave it set for a minute, and we'll have some fresh pressed coffee. So I, I took a chance when I came down to the lake's edge with my coffee to bring the uh, tripod and the camera down. Uh, the wind had changed, is changing again. Uh, it had turned, it's coming out of the north right now on my back, which is actually probably going to work out for the better because uh, the microphone being right here on my chest, I should be shielding it. Hopefully it's not, you're not picking up any wind noise. But it's, it's changing direction as the day moves on. And, uh, yeah, but to take an opportunity to come down and sit in the sun at the edge of the lake, couldn't pass that up. The camera tripod is actually two legs in the water. You can't see it, obviously, but uh, I'm a little bit, a little bit of a precarious. There's not much. There is no shore. It's just a little break between the bushes and uh, the water itself. And a nice rock for sitting on. That is strong. Doesn't get any better than that, though. So when I set out today, it's been about a week since I've been out here. And I had noted that even when I was fishing a little earlier, there were no black fly or mayfly on the lake and no black flies. That's changed in the last hour. I'm seeing mayfly, not a large hatch, but uh, there is mayfly just around the edge of the shore, just off of the water and black flies. So as the temperature warmed up today, the black flies are starting. So this will likely be the last time I get to go out this summer 
without putting any bug repellent on. So I'm going to enjoy it. And of course the other thing that has woken up, I don't know that if it ever went to fully to sleep, were the ticks. And I'm fortunate there's not a lot of ticks in this area, but there are ticks. I have found ticks on me. I have not found any embedded. I've always been able to get them off before they embed it. It's one of those things we have to raise the issue every year for everybody going out into the woods. People worry. I ran into somebody out here last time I was out. Young lady who has experience in the woods. Uh, we were social distancing, about 10 feet apart, and we talked for a little while. And uh, she was asking me about wildlife, what I've seen out here. Yes, I've seen coyote. I've seen a lot of other less dangerous animals. I've seen bear, a lot of deer, a lot of otters, lot, you know, those types of things. And she was a little concerned about the coyotes. I said, no, you know, at least not here. Uh, there are areas where the coyotes have been interbreeding with dogs and with wolves, and uh, that produces a much more aggressive animal. But all the coyotes I've seen here, all I've seen of them is their tail as they run away from me. I've never had any aggressive uh, coyotes come, or even curious. They hear me, or see me, or smell me, and they're gone. The bear, same thing. I've come in some fairly close contact with black bear, and had them just turn and hightail it. Search and rescue helicopter. At least once, every, every time I'm out here, there's a search and rescue helicopter coming over. But what I did suggest to the girl was, it's not the animals you can see, it's the ones that you don't, meaning the ticks. We all have to be careful about the ticks. Repellents, permethrin on your clothing if you're, it's available to you. There is tick repellents specifically. Uh, long pants, I won't go short pants anymore. Long sleeves, light colored shirts in the summertime are better, well they're better for staying cool anyway, but they allow you to see the ticks on you. Uh, I wear socks. If I'm going to be doing a lot of bushwhacking, I'll tuck my pants into my socks. Most of the time I don't because then I get sticks down inside my boots. But it's also, it is a good idea to tuck your pants into your socks. You want to avoid the ticks crawling up from there. I wear a tight-fitting boxer style sport brief to keep them getting into areas that are a little harder to see. And the moment I get home, I will be checking in the mirror and all over, especially the hairline. So be warned, be careful, but don't be afraid. You know, with the simple precautions and checking yourself over. And if you do find it checked on you, if it's embedded, try not to, well, you have to kill it, I guess. You gotta pull it out. And there are lots of videos showing how to get it out properly. But save it. Put it in a baggie, put it in the freezer, and uh, don't wait for symptoms of any Lyme or any other communicable disease to start. Head off to the doctor. The tick, there are, I think our drugstores, I have to double check, I think our drugstores will send them off for testing. But head off to the doctor. If you have a doctor that knows what he's doing, they will put you on at least a two-week antibiotic. Now that wind has got to be getting you. Feels good though, that wind does. Shifting again, now it's coming out of the south. Get off to the, get off to the, the doctor, ask them. If they don't suggest it, ask them. Don't wait for any test results because of course the Lyme tests are notoriously inaccurate. And by the time that you get two positive tests, you may well have the Lyme established in your body. So you want to hit it before you even can say you're showing any symptoms. Don't look for that bullseye rash. It may be there, but it, the absence of it doesn't mean that you weren't bitten and it doesn't mean you weren't infected. But like I said, don't be afraid. Just get out and enjoy this. And you know, there are times I sit here and I feel like I'm talking too much. I feel like I'm distor disturbing the, uh, the peace and tranquility of the wilderness. So maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe I'll just stop talking and let you enjoy this. I came, when I came down to the edge, I, I didn't catch them in time. I didn't have the camera ready. we a, a mating pair of mallards. And uh, they noticed me, but they didn't move. And then when I spoke to them, that's when they decided to take off. I should have got the camera out. It was kind of cool.
All right, I'm going to enjoy this sitting in the sun. And then I, I want to show you my backpack because I, I brought a different backpack out today. Okay, I'm not sure how well this is going to work between the sunlight and the wind constantly changing directions. I do have my microphone on, so hopefully it's going to cancel out some of the wind noise. Uh, I just wanted to take a second to show you my backpack. Not a review, absolutely. So it's been an hour and a half since I had my lunch, maybe a little longer. I said I'd show you my backpack, and I decided to wait until I was all packed up and heading out of the woods, because uh, you really can't see much above the backpack when it's empty. You have to kind of see it when it's full to, to get an idea of the size of it and that type of thing. So the background on this is uh, five years ago maybe I had an aunt uh, who left me a little bit of money in her will. We were kind of her primary caregivers. We gave uh, my wife and I take, taking care of her in her last years and she did have children but they weren't close by and she wanted to leave us a little bit of money so she did and uh, she knew I liked going out in the woods a lot so she said buy yourself something for the woods and that's exactly what I did and this is one of the things that I bought myself for the woods was this backpack it is an Osprey Aether 65 which is 65 liters uh, again I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on it right now I wore it on and off for two years maybe three and uh, then I received the Helicon Tex Matilda backpack for testing. So it became my exclusive use backpack up until this hike. This is the first hike in probably a year and a half that I haven't used the Helicon Tex, except for when I was carrying the, the satchel. But anytime I had a backpack on, it was the Helicon Tex. And I still love it, don't misunderstand me. It's still a wonderful bushcraft backpack. But I wanted to get this one out because it has a little bit more volume and uh, try it out. <coughs> Excuse me. So I wanted to get it out and try this one out. It has a, supposed to have a better suspension system. It's called an anti-gravity suspension system. I'm quickly going to show you that. I, I just kind of give you a 360. I think you may have seen it in the walk-bys uh, coming into the, into the woods. But uh, I think now I'll play around with this, see if I can't get it set up to my liking, and then I'll do a proper review of it. It is not a cheap backpack. There are more expensive ones, but this one is certainly on the rich side of things. But uh, it's pretty nice just the same. So let me lift it up. I have it pretty lo loaded, as I often do when I'm filming, a little bit overloaded. And it is an internal frame backpack but the suspension is sprung meaning that your back doesn't lay against it there is a mesh portion all through here and down the right through the waist belt and everything else that kind of gives you a little bit of air under your shoulders or under your back around your waist to allow a little breathability uh, it's very the waist belt is really stiff and grabs onto your hips and uh, does take a lot of weight off of the shoulders almost to the point of being uncomfortable on the hips now likely it's because i haven't got this broken in or set up properly uh, it does take some time for this to mold to the shape of your hips but uh, different <laughs> completely different than the matilda no well there are outside pockets but not like the matilda had the three big pockets on the outside so finding where everything was going to go in this was a bit of a challenge today i don't know that i'm happy with how i got it set up but it works anyway yeah, all right, so I'm going to put this back on and uh, head out the rest of the way out of the woods. Whew. It got a lot warmer today than I think it was expected. It's got to be 15 degrees Celsius. I, that's not warm, but it's warmer than anything we've had in a while. And the black flies are around. Still not, well, they're starting to get in my eyes and ears and nose and face, but uh, not too bad yet. So... I hope you've enjoyed this day that I brought you out in the woods to get a little fresh air, a little sunshine, have a wonderful lunch. 
Uh, that's what I wanted to share with you. I guess one of the reasons for coming out is I know that some people are unable to do what I do, which is to get out of the city, into the wilderness, enjoy a little piece of quiet, kind of uh, rejuvenate your body and your mind. Uh, I'm able to do that, so I thought it's pr if you wanted to, you could, I could share that with you. But uh, it's pretty much the end of the day now. I've been out all day, so it's time for me to head back. If you have any questions or suggestions or anything for my channel, things you want me to review, seeing things you want me to do, what you like, what you don't like, then um, you know why don't you put them in the, in the show note below. Maybe we'll have a question and answer video if there's enough. If not, uh, maybe I can just incorporate them into future videos. I have more things that I want to bring out and do for you in the woods. I think I'm going to start cooking more. I've got a few ideas, some uniquely Nova Scotian ones as well, and uh, things that you know should be simple enough and with with my lack of cooking skill if I can do it then certainly you can do it and probably do it better but uh, yeah I think that's where I'll leave it off today so unless I find something that's really exciting to show you I'm going to close the video down now I still have an hour <laughs> to get back to where my wife will be picking me up but uh, in the meantime folks get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference bye for now